Hey indie filmmakers, I'm Nick Bodmer. I'm Griffin Hammond, and on this week's episode, I share my favorite music libraries, and I'll take you through how I choose the best, most affordable tracks. Plus, your questions about slow motion, noise in your audio recorder, and when to use exposure compensation. Hello, Nicholas. Hello, Griffilis. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know why I said that, but it just felt right. It's- I've never had a good nickname. People have tried Griff and it just never stuck. <laughs> I could come up with some nicknames if you really want me to work on it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> They're not going to be complimentary, though. Let's be honest. Right. No, no. <laughs> All right. So we won't do that. Music. Let's talk music. Let's talk music. I uh, we, we always get lots of questions about where to find music, and I have recently made a decision to join a music library cool because i've in the past i've had access to libraries like jingle punks and audio network back when i was working at bloomberg yep and and i even you know i i had some music in in my ice documentary uh, yep. that i paid for that was four hundred dollars a track so there's a big jump between free music you know, sometimes we talk about Creative Commons music that you can use or public domain music. Uh, and then sometimes I find myself paying several hundred dollars for a track. And recently, I wanted to be able to do lots of client projects without having to ask all my clients, how much are you willing to spend on music? And do you want to use a free song or do you want to spend this much money? So I was trying to find, figure out a way to not spend <laughs> that much money. And what'd you come up with? Well, I ended up going with this website called Artlist. Which, Artlist? Yeah, A-R-T-L-I-S-T. Uh, and their model is that you pay $200 annually. Okay. Which at first, I'm kind of thinking like, oh, $200, even that, do I want to spend that much? But that's uh, half a song for what you've been paying before. Right, right? yeah. Some of, these, some of these websites are a la carte and you're paying $100 or $75 a track or $400 a track. And so $200 for annual complete access to a library seemed pretty good to me. And, and I also you, like that. And you that, get full copyright use. You can use it in per, you know, professional projects, commercial projects, things like that. Yeah, there's really no questions about what you're using it on. You can use it on tutorials, on podcasts, on client videos. And you have the license forever for everything. Uh, okay, so if you download it and maybe next year you stop paying, but since you used it there you get to keep going i think so and but although now it makes me think what would stop you from joining for a year downloading everything in the catalog <laughs> <laughs> and then never paying again although maybe then you're just deprived of the new music i don't know um, but yeah maybe you can do that interesting so i kind of want to compare this to the, the ones that I've used in the past, I'm pretty happy with Artlist now. I'll talk about what I like about it and what I don't like about it. But I'm curious. I never seem to know what the what some of the other ones even cost. Um, like Noisely is one that I've used, and that's the one where I was actually paying per song. Uh, and I paid $400 per song. That was uh, that was like negotiable. Like I think they wanted 1200 for a song, and I was able to get three different songs each for 400 uh but i don't even remember audio network we have access we had access to that when i worked at bloomberg they use that uh for their videos do we even know how much that one costs yeah i looked this up <clears throat> um they've got a couple different tiers depending on what you're going to be doing with it so they had the lowest tier is what they call for a creator which is basically non-commercial use so ah. what they describe as personal videos, Facebook, like your wedding, graduations, student projects, and that's... But presumably this would not cover YouTube tutorial videos that you monetize. It specifically does not cover that, yeah. Right. that That's only $10 a track. If, okay. Even if it's a personal project or a student project and you're going to uh, monetize on YouTube at all, that takes it up to $30 a track. But that's still, not still non-commercial use. They have oh, okay. a tier for professional use, which they describe as business, brand, or charity films, such as corporate film, explainer, how-to, or testimonial videos for websites or events. Um, 
It allows you to use it in online advertising, but only for campaigns with a media spend below two thousand dollars. So like small, oh, small advertisements, uh, and that's a yeah. hundred dollars. Okay. But if you want to go to TV, uh, including video on demand um, or branded content, whatever that means, I think you know m- bigger advertising stuff. You need to go get a pro license, and that professional license is a is a hundred dollars. So if you need to go to, to what, TV, like a month, and no per track, per track. Although Which I isn't assume bad. if you're like, if you're Bloomberg and you're using thousands of these tracks every month, they must be negotiating some sort of. And it does say, you know, license. are you are you a multiple production house? Come talk to us. Yeah. So, but if you just need a single track or a couple tracks, that's not bad. You know, a hundred dollars. Yeah. Uh, for their professional license would cover most of of the type of stuff that we do. Yeah, although that's what this is what bothered me looking at a lot of different sites was how how many different ways they define the possible license that you could have because I yeah. inevitably what happens on my projects is I'm doing this for a client they plan to put it on the web but then they decide later oh actually it'd be great to put this on TV or it'd be great to put this on to play it at trade shows and so I just think like I need a license that covers everything and I kind of experienced this with Sriracha. You, you could pay one license for, you know, the archival footage that I used. You could pay for a license that would get you uh, online playback, but it maybe didn't include theaters, and it didn't include film festivals, and it didn't include Blu-ray. And I had to get, you know, kind of an add-on license for each of those things. So really just to get, like, a perpetual forever everywhere license, I was having to build on to the original price. But I'm sure when I joined Artlist, that must have been part of my calculus that maybe I could get away with a $100 track from Audio Network, or I can get, for $200 annually, I can get hundreds of tracks. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, the the, the yearly subscription seems very reasonable. As long as yeah. the quality of the music is up to your standards and you're able to find what you need in a, in a reasonable amount of time, right? Is that pretty good yeah. on there? Well, yeah, let's talk about the, the quality, because I think, I think Artlist is somewhere in the ballpark of, like, 5,000 tracks. And I imagine Audio Network's probably even bigger. Mm-hmm. I don't know. But here, I, I really loved Audio Network, and actually, um, occasionally I work for clients that still have access to that network, so I still am able to use it for certain projects. Okay. And... Like, I'll play you one of my favorite tracks from Audio Network. Uh, I'll just play you a bit of it. Do you recognize this at all? It sounds familiar, but no, I I can't can't (laughs) place it. It's a track called Red Dwarf by an artist named Terry Divine King. Terry Divine King does a lot of tracks in the Audio Network library. It's one of my favorite tracks. It's called, uh, it, like I said, it's called Red Dwarf, and it's just it feels like so cinematic and mm-hmm. spacey. <laughs> it almost feels uh, like a Batman movie or something. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yeah. I did find there was a lot of stuff in that network uh, that sounded very Christopher Nolan, like yeah. stuff that sounded like Inception or Batman. Um, but I, I find that Audio Network has pretty much everything you could possibly want, every genre, you know, stuff that sounds cinematic, stuff that sounds very... Um, that sounds very uh, simple. Like, there's there's one kind of piece that I struggled to find recently in Artlist that I know there's a lot of in Audio Network, mm-hmm. and it's it's almost kind of uh, kind of stereotypical for the kind of work that you see on TV and documentaries. I'll play a track, a little bit of a track called "Crack Nutter" from the Audio Network library. It's like pizzicato strings. But what I like about a piece like this is it's kind of uneasy. Mm Mm-hmm. Like the chords are kind of... Yeah. That's something I really struggle to find on Artlist. Everything on Artlist is very, like, trendy and fun. But every once in a while, I just need something for a documentary or corporate piece that just sounds kind of simple and thought-provoking. I feel like you see that a lot in television and documentary. Like that would be perfect for like a crime 
documentary. Like, the investigators started to look into the problem, and you would just have something like that in the background. Or even, like, in my head, I don't know, as soon as you started playing that, I was seeing, like, a like a cooking reality show, and that's when, like, they were trying to figure out how they're going to, you know, complete this challenge, and it's kind of montage as they try different things. Yeah. So I I guess my, my general criticism of Art List is that it's not... It's not as vast of a library. And when I listen to a lot of tracks from that library, I feel like a lot of them sound kind of similar. Mm-hmm. And it's just sometimes it's hard for me to find the versatility that I need. Uh, like that, that's one hole right there. Like that kind of track I have trouble finding an art list. But then, you know, art list is $200 a year. <laughs> exactly. And you can still go yeah. out and license single tracks from other sources if you need to. Yeah. So let me play let me play some some art list tracks that I really like. Let's see. Um, here's one that I used on my Black Friday my Cyber Monday video. It's called Wonderland. It's very Christmassy. <laughs> I like it. Yeah, and it still sounds super professional. I think everything I'm finding on art list sounds great. Um, another track I really like is called The Peruvian Protest by Maxime Herve. And actually, I'll skip to the end of the song. This is actually how I listen to a lot of songs in an, in an audio library, is they start out very quiet, and I kind of need to know where does where, it build Where does to, it take you? Yeah. Yeah. So I'll often, as I start playing, you know, this is kind of a quick way for me to move through a lot of tracks in a library. I'll just jump to the middle, see what it's doing. And I know near the end of this one, I really like what it does. There's almost like there's this percussion that almost sounds like a ticking clock. Ticking clock. It sounds yeah, very. I can hear that. It sounds like Inception to me. I love this track. So I like that. Because I am a current subscriber to Artlist, I can play any of those tracks. I mean, we could, I could play you one of those tracks for just like the next forty minutes. I can and just play fact, a bunch of tracks. In fact, that's what we're gonna do. Congratulations, everybody! <laughs> it's been good talking. And that to would you. be completely within my right. And this podcast can live on the internet forever, and that's that's part of my license. Uh, are you worried at all that I've been playing Audio Network stuff that I don't have the right to play? Yes, yes, I am. <laughs> I don't want to get sued. So I am pretty comfortable in my fair usage of those tracks that I was only playing enough of them to give you a sense of what they are. We were I wasn't just playing them forever. Uh, hopefully I'm not, I, I doubt I'm hurting the market for Audio Network. If anything, I'm promoting it. You should check it out. But uh, I don't think anyone can like pull the audio from my podcast and go, well, I don't need to go to Audio Network anymore. I was able to download a whole one measure of it from Griffin's podcast. (laughs) And loop it, and then that's all I used, and now you're in trouble, Griffin. And I'm probably in trouble too, thanks. (laughs) So for that reason, I will also play you a little bit of a song that I don't have the license to use on this podcast, but I have used in another project. Let's see if you recognize this one. Do you know this song? I do. That's from the great documentary film Hand Cut by Nick Bodmer. Ah, yes. <laughs> Wait, you had nothing to do with that. Oh, somebody else. I forget who. Yeah, that was my documentary. So that was a piece. I really like that piece. That's how I started Hand Cut. Uh, it's called Time Out by an artist named Analia. Mm-hmm. That's actually the instrumental version. And that was one that I paid $400 for to use in the documentary. But I mean, that uh, adds to be- such character. I mean, that really sets the tone for the whole piece. Yeah. I mean, that, I, mean I can't I really, even imagine that documentary without that piece of music. I really liked that song. I also used a song called Doing the Right Thing that I really loved. Uh, this is by an artist named Addie Goldstein. And this was like that. This is also part. in the documentary? Yeah. Yeah. I think this was part I'll skip ahead. This is what I used during the chainsaw. Ah, yes. Yeah, I just love that piece. Now, had I known back then about Artlist, I probably could have found music in Artlist that I really liked and only spent $200 total rather than $1,200 total. Uh, But I learn. (laughs) 
Well, but and, I, I think those songs were and those good. songs are perfect. Yeah, I mean they're great. Yeah. So I mean, one thing I'd be concerned about with something like Artless, which is a subscription, is kind of pigeonholing myself into just what they have available. Like, do you still right. think you'll you'll try and go out of there for for big projects like Handcut was? No, I think I think sometimes it I struggle a little bit more compared to the bigger libraries to find exactly what I need, but I'm always finding what I need. Okay. Uh, like I've I've been using it for all the all the projects that I did for Panasonic, um, all the photographer profiles that I did. Like here, I'll play a bit of a song called Points North. This was in the Ben Gruno piece. Like when he's up on the mountain, I thought this was nice and ethereal. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Let's see. I also like used this song at the end of a tutorial video. This is called Singing O. I like this. <laughs> yeah, that's a fun piece. And then I also used like this piece called Clarity by Ian Post. Just a piano track. I think I used this on the uh, the drone footage video that I talked about two episodes ago. Sure, yeah, I remember that. So, like, so, there's a fair amount of diversity in the music. Well, and, you know, I struggle mightily with music because I've always been looking for royalty-free music, and the jump from what I have found to what you're playing right now is massive, right, in terms of yeah. quality and tone and appropriateness. Um, so I can totally see why someone producing even just basic YouTube videos that they want to monetize, this seems like a great deal. Yeah. I will say, like I've kind of alluded to, I wish there were more kind of underscore tracks in, in art list. They, they all are so bold. They all have a lot of personality and they all have a lot of tone to them. Mm -hmm. And sometimes when you're making tutorial videos, you're just like, I don't need it to be cinematic. I just need it to be interesting. Sure. Uh, so if, if art list is listening, maybe, uh, I'd love, or at least I'd love maybe some help finding those tracks in the, in the library. But I have been, without actively promoting art list, I included it on my, on my gear list, uh -huh. griffinhammond.com slash gear, where like I list all my gear that I use. At the very bottom, I added an art list link because they had, they have like this referral program where if you can get someone to join you get two months free and they get two months free. So I didn't want to like push it. I just put it on the bottom of this list and without even telling people to go there, a lot of people signed up. So actually now I have free for life access to art list. Get out of town. Because <laughs> <laughs> it, it takes uh, the way it works. I mean, I guess any of you could do this. If you go on art list and you join for $200 a year, you get two free months for every person that that you refer, and once you get to 10 referrals, you have lifetime access. Oh, well, that's nice for you. Yeah. But now you have nothing to gain, right? So we need to go find another one for you to promote. No, no. Actually, I, I still do have something to gain. Artlist probably noticed that I was doing a good job with those referrals, so they made me an actual, ref like, an ah, affiliate. Must be uh, nice. So now I get $20 for anyone that goes because of me than any, anyone who signs up because of me uh but the two month deal is still there if you sign up because of me you still get two free months and actually and i Griffin think anyone can bucks. have yeah yeah <laughs> so if you want so what you're saying me. is you've turned our podcast into a big old commercial <laughs> no i mean yeah <laughs> <laughs> guys if not it makes you feel for... better i don't get any money <laughs> so i am still unbiased <sighs> Mostly, I just I landed on it because another filmmaker that I know was using it. And I was like, "Whoa, why am I not using this thing that's pretty reasonably priced?" Um, and I think you can get thirty days for free. I think anyone can just try it and see if they like it. Um, but yeah, if you if you do want to check it out, you can go to griffinhammond.com/music, and I think you could try it for free. But also, if you do sign up for two year or for a year for two hundred dollars, you will get two additional months and I get $20. <laughs> well, thank you for being upfront about your conflict of interest, Mr. Hammond, but it does right. look like a good service, even to someone like me who has no 
financial stake. <laughs> but for people who don't want to spend money at all, where do you go? Um, I you know the the Incomp Tech is still kind of my go to. Mm. I mean, I'm that's a uh, that's Kevin McLeod. Yes, exactly right. Yeah. Um, his stuff can be very synthy, but he does a lot of stuff. There's, there's like a lot of ten thousand tracks in there, and um, you can uh, you can use it uh, monetized as long as you give him credit. So, uh, I think that's a great deal. <laughs> So yeah, I'll make sure in the show notes at hey.film, I'll put a link to audio, all the things we've talked about. Audio Network, Art List, Jingle Punks, Noisly. We'll put Kevin McLeod in there in Competech.com. Uh, I've also used a website, Free Music Archive. Okay. I think I've checked which, that out and I've just had trouble finding stuff. But I think some artists that I've really liked over the years, I, I found on Free Music Archive. Like I think... Um, Chris Sabrisky is one. I think I used at least one of his tracks in the Sriracha documentary and in the trailer. Um, But yeah, if you don't want to spend money, I mean, now that I'm doing so many client projects, I want to have a library that I'm allowed to use for anything. But uh, you can definitely find Creative Commons music that maybe only requires attribution, which may or may not be okay for your your client project. Are are they okay putting a, a credit to the artist? But if you're just making tutorial videos, there's plenty of free stuff out there that you can use as long as you give credit to the artist. Yep. But there's something about, I'm I'm so glad that I joined a library because I felt like I was kind of doing this thing where every project I was doing, I was like, okay, what do I do for music this time? Do I? (laughs) I've got my six tracks I like. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Just use them over and and over again. (laughs) I feel like it was kind of a long time coming, kind of like me paying for Creative Cloud. It's just like... You finally I don't love capitulated. Fifty five dollars a month, but like, I don't have to think about do I have access to the software that I need. Well, and you're and so, professional. Yeah. This is how you make all your income. You, right. I mean, you charge a, a relatively hefty rate, and you should have the proper tools at your disposal to to do that job. Yeah, cost of doing business, and you get to write it off. Yeah. So yeah, I think I I think I covered everything that I do about music but of course if you have questions you can leave them you can leave them in the YouTube comments or email us any music questions you have well should we get to some of the questions we have today yeah let's get to our non-music questions we have uh, we've got a YouTube comment from Tobias and Voldsen from Denmark uh, who says he's new to filmmaking I've noticed that many filmmakers of all levels that I'm subscribed to seem to use a lot of slow motion. I get that it makes footage look smooth and cool, but I'm really fed up with it. Am I the only <laughs> one feeling this way? How do you guys feel about slow motion? Is it too easy way of making good making footage look good? Is it cliche? I mean, he's mostly correct, I would say, wouldn't you? Yeah, I, I agree to an extent. Uh, I do also agree that slow motion often does make shots look really cool so sometimes it it is great to rely on it but uh but yeah a lot of people do that i i did kind of find that when i was doing wedding videos that my first wedding videos were always slow motion i think i i my first year or two of wedding videos were like 100 percent slow motion yeah like every that shot was the was trick in yeah slow motion. <laughs> And then at some point, I don't know if I got tired of it or I became a better shooter, but there was some point when I probably put all my stuff in the timeline, made it all slow motion, and just went, this isn't showing off what I did as well as it could. And I just switched it back, and I think I did several weddings where I just didn't use slow motion at all. I think it's probably just personal preference and what you've... Yeah, I mean, there's there's certainly a way to use it appropriately. I definitely leaned on it as a crutch, uh, especially in videos where I like I feel like I didn't have enough footage or something. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I think uh, I think being fed up with it is probably appropriate and with a lot of what we see out there today. Although I'm still shooting a lot of my documentary work in 4K 60p to either slow down to 30 or 24, depending on my timeline. And I kind of toggle back and forth. Like the latest project I was just editing, I th- I'm throwing in the B-roll. And every once in a while, I'll check a shot. I'll click on it and I'll say automatic speed in Final Cut. And it will take that 60 frame footage and stretch it out to, to 30. And I'll just see real quick, do I like the way this looks? And sometimes it looks super epic if someone's moving very quickly and now they're 
now they're like moving in super slow motion. It looks really cool. Other times I just go, oh, when you take the movement out of this frame, it actually is a lot less interesting. It's not really showing off what I want to see. So I kind of just check every once in a while on different shots and decide right then and there if it works or not. Cool. And that's probably a better way of going about it than just making a rule for yourself that everything is slow motion or not. We should do this whole podcast in slow motion. We could only re- we could record ten minutes and then stretch it out and then boom, <laughs> easy. Hey, indie filmmakers, I'm. <laughs> you sounded like Dory from Finding Nemo there, talking with. Yeah. Anyhow, that's another thing. If if I do slow motion, I almost never do slow motion audio because yeah. I always think that sounds pretty weird. So I usually turn down the audio and maybe i'll find some fake audio from somewhere else or, or perhaps it some music full speed. from yeah artist artlist.io artlist dot oh yeah it is it's not even dot com it's dot io or griffinham.com slash music thanks everybody <laughs> All right, we've got another YouTube comment from Lee Carswell. Griffin, you say that you normally shoot Panasonic in natural profile. Do you use a LUT when color correcting? If so, do you have any recommendations on a good LUT that matches well for the Panasonic natural profile? Last week, we talked about you recording uh, to an external recorder in Vlog for the first time. What did you find to match uh, your your normal shooting style? So I, uh, well, yeah, last week, it wasn't the first time I used Vlog, but it, because I tried it a long time ago with the GH4. Right. I just haven't needed it in years. So actually, this was the first time I was shooting Vlog on my GH5. And with that, that is so flat that I definitely need a, a, a LUT. I, I found a, a LUT uh, that, that really just a basic LUT that goes from Vlog to like Rec. 709. I loaded that onto my Atomos monitor recorder so that I could see the shot normally. I also could have loaded it on my GH5 and change the way it displays on the screen while still recording vlog. But for natural, which is how I shoot most of the time, natural is a profile that's not nearly as flat as vlog. It's a little tiny bit flatter than standard and a little bit less color saturation, but it's still pretty much done. It's a finished look. Uh, and you don't need a LUT for that. Like, so I, I really have not used LUTs much and would only really need to use them with vlog. Uh, haven't so needed I, to with natural. I guess the question though is: Have you found a LUT that takes vlog and gets it to look like what natural looks like, or no? No. Uh, in fact, I've noticed that I've noticed that the difference between natural and vlog with a LUT can look very different. So when I film myself, I do think that vlog with like a Rec. 709 LUT on it can look more normal, more the way your eye actually sees things. Like I notice when I film myself, I get kind of a, maybe a less yellow image. My face seems to look very white and you can see all like the red freckles. It's kind of like white face with red splotches, which is how I look, which is funny because natural looks different. It looks a little bit warmer, a little bit more yellow and more color. Mm Mm-hmm. And that's maybe not how I look in reality, but it is a more flattering look for me. <laughs> like it's a I more, think you look great, Griffin. Don't get so down on yourself. So I do find that the skin tone is different in natural versus V-Log with that, this particular LUT on. Um, but I like the way that looks. I, I tend to like a warmer image. Mm-hmm. Um, that's just kind of my, maybe I've just grown to, to love natural because I've shot with it for so long. So it is worth playing with both, uh, but yeah, I don't have a specific LUT in mind that you should use. For those who don't know what a LUT is, it's a lookup table, which actually doesn't really help <laughs> explain what it is at all. <laughs> it really just, it's its how, how should the computer or the monitor or the camera uh, interpret this footage you're giving it. So it changes the look uh, of the shot. It's for color grading. We got an email from Luke who recently purchased the, not the Zoom H4n that you and I both have, but they now have a Zoom H4n Pro. Oh. I think it's pretty much the same. I didn't know anything about uh, that. Let me look it up. It looks a little bit different, but it, I mean, it's mostly the same feature set. Uh, he's noticed a horrible hissing slash static sound is present. So he's shooting, he's recording with the levels around 60, 
uh, which I believe is out of 100. And let's see, there's not much else going on, uh, but you can hear if nothing's happening, um, well, he says when, when the levels are at 100, it's just like unusable level of noise. And he says this happens for both the in-built, the built-in microphone on top or using the mic jack uh, at the back or also for the XLR input. So I guess any way that he's plugging stuff in, he's getting a lot of noise in the background. And he's messed around with different settings but can't figure out what is going on. So first we should start with just what are you recording your audio with right now? You're actually using a computer, I'm using the right? Zoom H4n. Uh my mic is plugged okay. into that, and then that's outputting to the computer, and the computer's recording it. But I am using the H4n as basically a, a digital or an analog to digital converter. Um, so your the volume you're choosing on the Zoom does that matter, or is it all it like does. Yep. the digital output? Yep. Okay, no, so that's, what's a, your that's a gain control. I'm at about 35 right now on my mic. Um, okay. 60 is is certainly high, and I'm not surprised you're hearing noise at 60 when things are quiet. Um, basically, the 0 to 100 number, you're controlling the gain, so how much it's amplifying the signal, and there's inherently noise um, in these systems, and when you crank it up, you're going to hear it a little bit. 60, it should be a very usable sound. If it's not usable at 60 when, when you're hearing real audio, then, then there might be a problem, but if you're just listening to the background noise and noticing you can hear it, that's not real surprising. Adobe Audition has a really good noise reduction tool um, that can maybe help clean that up a little bit if it's really bothering you during quiet parts. Um, at 100%, I'm not, or 100 gain, I'm not surprised that it's unusable. I don't think I've ever gotten anywhere close to that high. If, um, if you're finding the need to crank it up that much, my guess is your mics are not close enough to your source. Yeah. That would be my that guess. Like. So you're recording at 35 out of 100 on the Zoom. I think right. when I used to do indie mogul videos with my h4n and a shotgun mic the shotgun mic was maybe a foot or two feet away from my face uh i, I believe i was always recording at around 51 okay which yeah, makes sense because right. like right now with the podcast you're really you're on top of your mic exactly um <clears throat> so, and that always worked for me uh one thing i would check though is just i noticed this a lot uh depending on the way you're editing your audio if you're just using one of the inputs, I usually turn the odd, the levels down on the other input. Because mm -hmm. like if you have input two set to 100, there will be a bunch of noise on your second channel. And depending on the way your editing software interprets that, it may just be layering two mono signals on top of each other. And you may be hearing the noise channel and the good channel. Uh, so I would make sure that your other channel in your editing software is switched off. Yep. Or like on my H4, like right now I am only recording channel one. It's the only one active right now. I'm basically in mono mode. Yeah. But I guess we know that's not his problem because he's talking about how he's getting these problems even with the built-in mic, which right. is a stereo mic. So he's hearing left channel and right channel. Um, but yeah, I got to think any of the mics you're using, you just got to get them as close as you can because you want to get a good signal to noise ratio. We know that if you're turning this thing all the way up to 100, you have a bad signal to noise ratio. Uh, and if you can get your signal to be really loud, there's always going to be that noise there. But the lower you can turn down that number, the better that ratio is going to be. Exactly right. We've got a Twitter comment from Fred Yonk. What class of SD card do you use when shooting? He's got a 60D, and he's being told he must use a class 10 card. But he's finding out that he could have used a class 6. I can never remember what those classes mean. I think most of my SD cards are class 10. Class 10 is the usual recommendation for 1080p video. Um, okay. You know, you can get away with a class 6 or even a class 4 for maybe 720, but you know, if there's a hiccup, if there's a problem, you're going to you're going to corrupt your data stream. So, not usually recommended and they're not that uh, expensive anymore. So, yeah. the speed class ratings do define a minimum speed. Class 2 is 2 megabytes a second, class 4 is 4 megabytes a second, class 6 is 6 megabytes a second. Can you guess what class 10 is? 10 megabytes of write speed per second? Minimum sequential writing speed, 10 megabytes, yes. And yep. that is the same as UHS speed class 1. So there's also class 1 yes. and class 3. And so a class 10... Yeah, I think 10, all of my cards say class 10 UHS 1. Yes. So those are the same. They do have a slightly different testing methodology, I believe, which is why they're, they are different. But in general, those are compatible. And then uh, class 3 is... Can you guess what class 3 is? If class 1 is 10, what's class 3? 
30 megabytes per second. God, you're speed. good. You're good, good, good. So I actually uh, think in, that's what you in, got. In, I must be wrong about maybe my old cards that I used to use were class 10. I must have UHS-3 cards now because if you take those megabytes, let's, let's take 10 megabytes per second of write speed, multiply that by 8, that's how many megabits per second you have. So a class 10 card can handle 80 megabits, which would handle, I think, all video from the GH3 and older. I think the GH3 can only do like 24, maybe up to 72 megabits mm -hmm. per second. The GH4 and GH5 can do like 100 megabits and 150 and even 400 now. Uh, so I think just to handle the 150 megabits per second that I do a lot, I would need a UHS-3, which would be what? 240 megabits per second yeah that's right yeah so that's plenty for me and i guess i would i would need an even faster card if i wanted to use the 400 megabit recording so in conclusion you should be buying class one cards which are pretty much the same as class 10 cards for most workflows and if you're doing yeah. extremely high bit rates time to look at class three yeah and hopefully if you're buying a camera that does that you know does 100 megabits or plus Hopefully you're buying it because you want it to do that and you know that you need a faster SD card. Yep. Otherwise, you may be, it may be overkill. Uh, we got an email from Hugh who says he comes from a camcorder background and is still trying to figure out why you would use exposure compensation. He has some manual Rokinon cine lenses and he also has the Panasonic Leica 12 to 60 millimeter F2.8. Uh, and he seemed a little bit confused about exposure compensation because he was thinking maybe he would only ever use it on his Panasonic lens, that maybe he can't use it on Rokinon. Um, but actually, you can use it... You can definitely use it with a manual lens. But I don't, I don't think I ever really use exposure compensation. Do you know if you do? I don't because I've kind of switched to shooting mostly in full manual and there's no exposure yeah. compensation in a manual mode. But exposure compensation comes into play when you're in any auto mode or semi auto mode <laughs> in terms of exposure yeah. so if you're shooting in um you know in fully automatic mode if you're shooting in uh, aperture priority or shutter priority or even program mode if you're shooting photos um, the camera is making a determination as to how bright the frame should be and what exposure compensation does is say is kind of manually overriding what the camera thinks is properly exposed so if you're in a very bright scene and uh, the sky is blown out, uh, the automatic mode on the camera might make things look a little too dark um, to get the sky uh, exposed properly. And you can say, no, I want, I want this to be generally brighter. So you increase the exposure compensation. And then the camera knows in its automatic calculations to make things a little brighter or, or the other yeah. way around. In fact, you're not even really overriding you're kind of adding on to because the camera's still going to choose to when to go brighter or darker. You're just saying, I would actually like it to be even brighter. <laughs> exactly. Just add more brightness onto what you're already doing. So, but yeah, he, I, I, I'm almost always in manual mode, so I don't need this. Although I occasionally do use shutter priority mode. Maybe if I'm photographing something and I've kind of decided, like, I know I'm going to need a shutter that's fast enough to get the right amount of motion blur, I might do shutter priority and let the camera figure out the aperture and the ISO. And in that case, I guess I could use exposure compensation to push it up or down. But I guess I've always been happy with what the camera does. And if I'm shooting raw, I kind of feel like I'll have enough latitude there to fix it. I don't really need to push it either way. And he asked what physical part of the camera actually makes the exposure compensation work. And, and that just depends on which automatic mode you're in. So if you're in aperture priority yeah. where you're choosing the aperture, the camera is going to adjust the shutter speed to expose properly yes. so it will adjust your your shutter speed um you know in reference to whatever you set your exposure compensation so if you say no i want it a little bit brighter than what you think camera it's going to um, lower the shutter speed if you're in shutter priority mode and saying no i want 60 uh one sixtieth of a second as my shutter speed it's going to be adjusting the aperture yeah in fact and i even checked it in movie mode in manual movie mode even if the only thing you have set to auto is your ISO, like you could have everything in manual exposure, you're, you're setting mm -hmm. the aperture mm -hmm. and the shutter. But if you set your ISO to auto, you can then use exposure, uh, compensation. exposure compensation as well. 
So when would you need this? Anytime you're in a uh, semi-automatic mode. Is that even really a yeah. term? Or should I just be calling these auto modes? I'm not sure. Uh, no, I, I like that you're that calling it, it semi-automatic because there are like shutter priority. You pick the shutter, the camera picks the aperture. Yeah. Not, um, you haven't given complete control away. But anytime you're using one of those modes and the camera is is basically not making the decisions that you would like it to make, and that's usually going to be in a situation of extreme brightness in part of the frame or, or extreme darkness, right? Yeah. Uneven lighting situations where it's having a hard time making those decisions. So we have an email from Yobi, and I feel like we should treat his like a lightning round because he had a lot of questions All right, about let's go. the photography career. He says it's a very competitive career to get into. Is it hard to get a job in photography? Yes. And no. <laughs> Is it also hard to make money as a photographer? Mm, yes and no. <laughs> yes and no. Everything's yes and no. <laughs> Is photography considered a career or a hobby and why? Does photography help people? My goodness. Yeah. I mean, I think sometimes I'm jealous of photographers as a video person. I've even talked about this with photographers recently that like sometimes I wish my job was over after I took five good photos and knew which ones I was going to edit in Lightroom later and deliver to the client. Like the editing in video is a, is a long process that seems to me could be easier in photography. Although I still admire people who can tell so much story in one frame. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> He also says that someone told him that photography is one of the most challenging, difficult careers. It has said a lot of work and very competitive. It is not for everyone. Well, is here's that what, true? Here's what I think. I think now is a great time to get into photography. It's never been more accessible, right? Cameras are, yeah. are, are, are great. Everybody's got a phenomenal camera in their pocket with their uh, smartphone. And that's really great for getting into it and learning about it. And it's very accessible but that's also what makes it a very difficult career is you really have to differentiate yourself in order to to take it to the next level right um because yeah. so many people can be involved in it and you see all the time um people wanting to not pay photographers very well because you know everyone's got a nephew with a camera who who thinks they can take pictures um right. so so it's it's a blessing and a curse is what i would say um but anything you put the time into and and really try and master the craft and not just the the technology i think uh is going to help you so i think if it's something you're passionate about um you should definitely jump in yeah definitely i remember the very beginning of film school at new york university one of the first questions they asked the whole incoming freshman class was how many of you want to be directors and you can imagine 90% of the group raised their hand. And then they asked, how many of you want to be directors of photography? And a few people raised their hand. And they were like, do that. If you want to be a DP, be a DP. Because there are not, you know, everyone wants to be a director. Everyone wants to be a writer director. And you're going to be competing. And so, like, to your point about differentiating yourself, find that special thing that you can do in photography that not everyone else is doing. And that's where you might have better luck. I also think if you're just super nice to people, like a lot of photography is being around clients and then being comfortable with you and them hiring you for all their things. I mean, you could be someone's personal photographer if they just love spending time with you. Yep. And you don't have to be the best one. Our final question is an email we got from Mile from Canada who is looking for an ND filter for outdoor video. And he also has a few different questions. Uh, one, he's wondering if he can get sharp, better sharpness from more expensive filters. Um, I actually haven't bought too many cheap versus expensive filters to know, but I've always kind of assumed you get sh better sharpness on the more expensive ones. Um, he's also wondering about the the darkness ratings. Like, what is the one I'm using right now? Mine is an ND 0.9. And that's an 8x reduction in light. But I think he's just confused about why do they use all these different numbers. Like, I think it's also called a a 103 ND filter. I don't know why they use all this these This is numbers. how photographers keep all these newcomers out of the, <laughs> right. out of the game, right? <laughs> Let's make it all really confusing so that people like, who is our good friend, Yobel, have trouble getting into it. Right. Yeah, I, ND filters confuse me. But um, I just bought the one you told me, and, and then I move on with my life. Which one did you get? I don't know. <laughs> was it a, was it a variable? Did you you a gave variable me one? an extra variable one you had, but no, I bought one of those B and W, um, you know, one of those really dark ones for uh, time lapses. 
Oh, was it? So it must be like a 3.0. I was going to say an ND3, but I can't remember. Yeah. Yeah, I think, um, you know, his last question is about if you need variable ND filters. And he, he worries about this. The, the the X that can the X pattern that can show up on an ND filter, a variable ND filter. So like I have one of my variable ND filters right here and you turn it to make it darker. But yeah, there is this thing that happens when you get all the way to the darkest point and if your camera is exposed up enough to see the the problem, it it gets this like cloudy X uh, in your shot. So you don't want to use it all the way at the end. I don't think that variable ND filters are necessarily bad i've just learned that the lenses i'm shooting with outside i always need a 0.9 nd filter that that at eight x reduction in light that's three stops reduction in light that's the one i need outside so i just decided i should just get a bunch of those perfect and they work well in all my lenses actually for some like mountain when i was like really up in the air uh, up on top of mountains and we were getting really harsh sunlight i found maybe i need like a seven stop I think I need like a six or seven stop ND filter to add to my collection. But that's that's less common, you're saying? Yeah, I feel like I'm not usually filming in like total hard sunlight, um, but occasionally I am. And then I, I need the ND3, which is a thousand X reduction in light. I don't know how many stops that is. That's the one I use for time lapses to get the appropriate shutter speed. It's because you want that motion blur. So I guess like a variable ND filter was helpful for me to figure out what I need, but once I kind of started using ND filters a lot, I just realized why, why even risk the fact that maybe I'll get that weird pattern or some loss of sharpness or some discoloration. Let me just get the ones that I know work well. For what so I in do. conclusion, a 0.9 for general outdoor videography and a ND 3.0 for time lapse. Yeah, that's what's worked for me. Perfect. That was a speed round, huh? Yeah, yeah. Ooh. Well, we had some. I, I saved some some heavy multi question questions for the end. <laughs> you sure did. All right. <laughs> but we've come to the end yet again, my friend. Yeah. So, uh, one last reminder: we always put show notes at hey.film. If there's anything we, any links we talked about today that you want to check out, you can find them at hey.film. Beautiful. Well, Mr. Hammond, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Thanks for listening, yeah. everybody. We'll see you next week. Bye. You start even-numbered episodes and I start odd-numbered episodes? Yep. I did not know that. I figured that out on like this latest batch of episodes. <laughs> <laughs>